All right, so uh, we will look at bootstrap today. I hope uh, I hope your ninth week is going well. Um, and so, you know, we introduced randomization tests on Monday. And, you know, in this section, we're kind of doing statistical inference without relying on the central limit theorem. We're doing, you know, doing our the randomization stuff ourselves. So, um, you know, we need a sampling distribution for to be able to do statistical inference, right? The sampling distribution tells us what kind of values we can get uh, for a sample statistic when we draw random samples from the population. And by looking at this, say, the, uh, the sampling distribution, we can get a sense of how much a sample statistic can vary. And if we have, uh, if we have data, then we can compare the statistic from our data Right, and compare that to the sampling distribution, and we might generate the sampling distribution when the null hypothesis is true. We'll say like, okay, the null hypothesis says the mean is this, you know, this is what the sampling distribution will look like. How often can you get a sample where the mean is this, all right, something else? And we can say, oh, you know, that's probable, or it's very improbable, and therefore if you have a small p-value, you might say, well, you know what, I think my null hypothesis is wrong. So we kind of compare our sample's value versus the sampling distribution to say, hey, is my sample weird, okay? And is it weird because of randomness or is it weird because my uh, assumptions are wrong, all right? So the central limit theorem, we, um, you know, we, we relied heavily upon in intro stats and, um, and that basically says that, you know, when you look at something like the sample mean, or really it applies to anything that uh, is derived from a sum, we say that, you know, the sampling distribution of the sample mean, we can approximate that with a normal distribution, okay? And, and you know, I don't know how much emphasis was put on how important the cent central limit theorem was, but basically all of the uh, intro stat stuff, you know, your, your t-test and your z-test, you know, depend on this mathematical concept of the central limit theorem, that, you know, when we look at the mean of a sample, and you know we look at the sampling distribution of the mean that we can approximate it with the normal distribution and and um, not everything follows the central limit theorem um, you have sampling distributions for really any statistic that can be calculated from a sample so so if you're not dealing with the mean uh, you're dealing with something else like the standard deviation or the variance then those those distributions are not uh, not governed by the central limit theorem. They won't follow a normal distribution, okay? Uh, the proportion, proportions follow a central limit theorem because you can think of proportions as a mean as well, right? I instead of, uh, if you look at, you know, what proportion of values, uh, you know, are in a certain category, you can kind of think of that thing as the mean of zeros and ones, right? Which is basically what we ask for, you know, when in R, if you have a logical vector and you want to find the proportion true, you just say, what's the mean of this logical vector? And it turns everything into zeros and ones and you get the proportion. And so um, central limit theorem applies to proportions and that's why you can do a z-test for proportions because it's basically a sample mean as well. But, um, but yeah, if you wanted to do something with say the variance of a sample, uh, central limit theorem doesn't really work there anymore, okay? So for values other than the mean, uh, you know, you'd have to rely on kind of your mathematical knowledge of probability distributions, and I think a lot of this was covered in, say, uh, stats 100B or what is it, math 170S is the equivalent, or is it E? I, I forget which letter is which one. But, um, um, but even if you don't remember exactly the math mathematical distribution to use, we can use uh, simulations to approximate the sampling distribution. Now, whenever we do a simulation, we have to make assumptions about the population. Um, and that's really, anytime you do statistical inference, you have to make assumptions. Uh, there's no avoiding, you can't avoid making assumptions, right? Anytime you're trying to infer something, you've got to make assumptions along the way. Because statistical inference is the idea that you've got a sample, and based on the sample, 
we're making conclusions about the population, right? We didn't observe the population directly. So in order to go from the sample to the population, we have to kind of fill in the gaps. We have to make assumptions, right? And you know, one of the most basic assumptions is that my sample is representative of the population. That's a, that's an assumption, okay? Um, and other things that you might we might assume are like, okay, the sampling distribution of the population looks like the normal distribution, and and that's uh, often a safe assumption to make because. The central limit theorem is uh, is something that's reliable uh, if you're looking working with a big sample and things like that. But uh, you know, in cases where you don't want to assume the central limit theorem applies, you still have to make other assumptions. And those other assumptions might be things about, say, the population's shape, or the population's mean and standard deviation, or uh, what values can appear in the population, or things like that. Um, so you might assume the population is normal, or you might assume the population is uniform, or the population follows this distribution or that distribution. You've got to make some assumptions somewhere along the way. Um, if you're comfortable, and once you've made your assumptions, then you can go ahead and simulate the sampling distribution. Um, and all you do is you just repeatedly draw samples of a given size, and you do this repeatedly over and over and over again. You record all of the different sample statistics, you keep track of them all, and, and then you have something that looks like a sampling distribution. I think um, one of the things that distinguish you know, a good data scientist from maybe a dangerous one is uh, a good data scientist is aware of the assumptions that they are making, and a dangerous one is not aware of the assumptions they are making. Um, and uh, because, you know, you might learn some kind of technique, some kind of method that can be applied in certain situations because some, you know, you know, application of this technique or method makes certain assumptions, and you can say, all right, I think these assumptions are reasonable and valid, right? Um, if you aren't even aware of what assumptions you are making along the way to to use this thing, then you could end up you can end up making all kinds of conclusions. And, uh, and those conclusions are invalid because the, the assumptions that you've made along the way um, were not good, right? And that's not just statistics, it's really all of life. If you, if you make too many assumptions, you can end up, uh, you know, drawing, coming to the wrong conclusion. Um, but, you know, certainly you should be aware of what assumptions you're making um, in, uh, when, when you're doing, you know, statistical inference. All right, we'll take a look at the parametric bootstrap first. I think this one is um, maybe conceptually a little bit uh, easier to kind of explain, or I don't know if easier is the right word, but just like um, uh, we can start here, right? So the procedure of uh, simulating the sampling distribution by making parametric assumptions about the population is known as parametric bootstrap. Um, you know, the, this term bootstrap kind of comes from the idea of like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps um, and uh, and it's I don't know it's kind of like the idea of can you accomplish a task without additional help uh, and in the per context of statistics here it's like can you do inference without having to s gather additional data or something like that right I don't know where this phrase uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps came from uh, one theory that I kind of like, uh, and who knows if it's true or not, is that there's like a, there was a folk tale, and there was you know some kind of you know the folk hero was walking along, got stuck in a swamp, and what was the solution to get unstuck from the swamp? He grabbed his bootstraps and he um, he pulled himself out. Right? Again, ridiculous, but it's kind of funny. Um, you know, <laughs> this idea of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Now it has you know certain political connotations and stuff, but whatever. Okay. Um, well, anyway, the idea here is we're gonna with parametric bootstrap, we're gonna assume the population follows some specified parametric distribution, right? It could be something like the population follows a normal distribution with this mean and standard deviation, or the population is uniform with this. Dis uh, you know, with this max and min, and or the population follows a whatever uh, I don't know exponential distribution or a Poisson distribution or you know any of these other distributions you've learned along the way. Okay, and then we say, all right, if this population, if we assume this population, you know, looks like this, 
you know, let's draw random samples from this population. Uh, for each random sample, let's calculate some kind of statistic. Let's record this uh, a bunch of times. We'll create a sampling distribution this way. And then once we have a sampling distribution, we can do statistical inference. So, um, I don't know, do you guys take the SAT? A lot of you, uh, I'm not, I know uh, UC is kind of uh, moving away you know, a lot of schools are moving away from the SAT. Uh, tech, okay, so SAT verbal, technically it's called the Evidence-Based Reading and Writing Exam. Um, the, the scores are designed to be normally distributed with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100 for the general population of high school seniors. Um, and then it's, tech, it's not... It's designed to be normally distributed. It's not normally distributed because technically the normal distribution goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, and the SAT verbal has a cap at 800 is the highest, and the lowest is 200. And then um, it's not continuous. You can only get scores in increments of 10, so you can get like a 640, but you'll never get a 638 or a 636 or something like that. Um, and then also, if you look at this distribution of actual scores, it doesn't look normal because um, it's designed to be normal for the general population of high school seniors and the population of students who take the exam is um, usually college bound seniors which is a different population than the general population and so the uh, the distribution of scores is not uh, exactly normal but um, but we will go ahead and just make this assumption that uh, our scores are normally distributed with a mean of 500, standard deviation of 100 after we, you know, round to the nearest 10 and things like that. All right, let's say we take a random sample of 15 students. Um, what is the sampling distribution of the sample variance? Okay, so if the population has mean 500 and standard deviation 100, what is like approximately what our sample variance would be? Like if you take a big enough sample. Approximately your sample variance should be around anybody? 100 squared? So around 10,000. That's what we would expect our sample variance to be. And the pop quiz here says if I did this a whole bunch of times and I recorded the sample variance, okay, what probability distribution can we use to model the sample variance of a sample of random normal values. You guys remember this from your mathematical statistics 100b? Huh? Chi squared, chi squared, yes. Okay, good. Um, if we don't remember chi squared, we can, we can still simulate the sampling distribution here, okay? Um, and so here I'm going to just draw one random sample of 15 values from a normal distribution. So I use R norm. I'm going to get 15 values, mean of 500, standard deviation 100. Uh, I use round and I do a negative one and that rounds it to the nearest tenth. Okay. And then, um, and I'm going to say if any of the values are over 800, replace it with an 800. If any of the values are less than 200, replace it with a 200 because uh, that's kind of what the uh, the thing does. Now, in, in this particular sample, none of the values were over 800, none of the values were under 200, but here are 15 potentially random values for uh, uh, SAT. And then, um, and if I say, what's the variance of this? I get 10,120, which is kind of in line with getting 100 squared. So, so that's that, okay? Um, I could do this uh, again and again, all right? And I'm gonna say, you know what? Let me repeat this process 10,000 times. Okay, so I'm going to keep track of 10, uh, do this 10,000 times. So I'm going to do for i and basically 1 through 10,000. And we do the same thing. Draw a random sample of 15 values, round them, replace any values over 800 with 800, replace any values with less than 200 with 200. And then uh, calculate the variance of my sample and record all of my sample variances. So I'm going to record this 10,000 times. And I could say, all right, what is the mean uh, sample variance? And I get something right around 10,000, okay? Uh, the median's a little bit less than that. My maximum sample variance happens to be, you know, close to 30,000, 29,800. And my minimum sample variance is, you know, 1,500. Um, 
and I could create a plot histogram of all of my sample variances, and this is what I have, right? And um, and if I say, well, you know what, you know, how do, how does this compare to the theoretic distribution? So the theoretic distribution is chi squared, but you have to multiply it by this constant n minus one over sigma squared. I don't know if anybody remembered that, but um, if if you have you know x x one x two up through x n are I id from a normal distribution with this thing, and s squared is a sample variance then the distribution of the sample variance follows a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So we have a chi-square distribution with 14 degrees of freedom after we multiply our sample variance by this kind of uh, constant. So here I can do that. Um, I have my constant 14 over uh, 100 squared, and then um, and I scale the thing, and I, so I create my histogram of values. I plot the theoretic um, density curve, okay, PDF of the chi-square distribution with 14 degrees of freedom, and indeed we get close alignment between um, the observed values and what we got, okay? But maybe maybe you didn't remember that, and that's okay, right? Even if you didn't remember the sampling distribution of the variance, you know, follows that chi-square distribution, we can still... Um, use this parametric bootstrap by kind of simulating the sampling distribution directly. So here, here's a problem, right? Let's say we have a sample of 15 SAT scores and we calculate the variance of my 15 SAT scores and the variance is 20,000, right? So we go, oh, that's, that's kind of high. Um, could this sample of 15 values still be a random sample drawn from the population where the mean is 500 and the uh, standard deviation is 100, okay? Or, you know, is it reasonable to believe that the sample is not a random sample drawn from this population, right? So our null, our, our hypothesis test will say sigma is equal to 100. My alternative is that sigma is greater than 100, that uh, the sample that I, you know, these values I have here were not randomly drawn from this population, right? So how do I get, um, how do I do this hypothesis test? Well, I'm going to say, okay, well, let's look at my distribution of uh, um, sample variances that I get. And how often do we get a value over 20,000? Okay, how often do I get a value over 20,000? All right. And it says, um, you know what, that happens 1.2% of the time, okay, with probability 0 0.012. So... Um, is it possible for us to draw a random sample of 15 values, okay, calculate the variance, and that variance ends up being 20,000 or higher? It could happen. How often does it happen? It happens only 1.2% of the time, okay? So um, if this is the case, either my sample is I got really lucky or unlucky, however you want to look at it, and I got one of the lucky 1.2% of samples that produced a sample with a variance with a variance of uh, 20,000, or something else is going on. Maybe my sample is not randomly drawn. Maybe I'm drawing from a different population or something, right? And uh, and so what do you think? Well, if I use a significance level of 5%, I would say, um, you know, 1%, 1.2% is low enough where I'm going to say I don't think this was randomness. I think the reason why I'm getting this sample where the variance is 20,000 is that something is going on. I don't think I was one of the lucky 1.2% 1, 1 of samples that, that produced this thing, right? It's kind of like if I did a magic trick, right? I show you uh, some cards, you draw a card, and then I, I, I reproduce your card, right? You, you know, you get the, the card, and I, I get it right, okay? Um, you know, you might be impressed, right? Depending on what I do, if I show you your card, you might be like, oh, wow, you know, how'd you do that, right? You might also, <laughs> a, a thing you can also come away with is just like, oh, that's not impressive. Um, you had a one out of 52 chance of getting it right by randomness anyway, right? And that's true. Uh, <laughs> I could just do the most ridiculous thing and I will get it right one out, you know, with a probability one out of 52. So you could either think, well, I was, you know, you just got lucky, one, of the, one out of the 52, or, you know, you've done something to figure out my card, right? And again, we could be one of the lucky 1.2% or 
something actually uh, is going on. And so, you know, we're going to say, well, 1.2% is small enough. I don't think I was just one of the lucky 1.2%. I think, um, you know, maybe our sample is not a random sample drawn with a mean of 500 and standard deviation 100. Okay, something else is going on. Um, here's here's situations where maybe you don't we don't know the um, theoretic distribution. So okay, let's keep working with these SAT verbal scores. Let's pretend we have a classroom of twenty five students, and that we're going to get um, uh, our SAT. We're, we're going to look at the SAT scores of all twenty five of these students, and we're going to assume this is a random sample. Probably not a good assumption because a lot of times schools will separate students into you know different kind of tiers of students and things like that or tracks of students I should say um, what is the sampling distribution of the highest score in the class right so if you have 25 students and we look at who got the highest score and then I can ask what's the probability that the highest score in 25 students is 750 or higher okay would we know how to answer this theoretically What's the probability that in the, the highest score out of 25 is 750 or higher? So there is a theoretic distribution that we could use. It's called the Gumbel distribution, and I don't know if you guys are very uh, familiar with it. Um, and it can be used to describe extreme values like the maximum or minimum or things like that. But you know, I don't know how many people are familiar with it and uh, or even to be able to use it. So instead, we're going to use um, parametric bootstrap. Again, we make this big assumption that we know what the population looks like, that it's mean 500, standard deviation 100, and we're going to just generate random samples. So this is what my code would look like. I'm going to do this 10,000 times. I'm going to draw 25 values from the normal distribution. I'm going to turn them into SAT scores by rounding them, replacing the max with 800, the min with 200, or, or not max, but just like any values higher than 800 with 800 and any values less than 200 with 200. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, take the maximum value of your sample, right? This is the student with the highest score, right? And we're going to record that. So I do this 10,000 times. So I'm going to have 10,000 uh, samples of 25. And for each sample, I'm recording the, the highest score. Okay, So we're not recording the, uh, the mean. We're not recording something else. We're recording the highest score. And um, overall, the highest score, the median highest score in 25 is 690. You know, uh, we get some samples where the highest score is 800. Um, the third quartile is 730. This is um, what our distribution looks like. And we can see, you know, that the, the effect of replacing anything higher than 800 with 800 looks like this um, and things like that. So this is the histogram of the highest score out of 25 students. Okay, and we want to know, okay, how often do you get 750 or something higher? And so we just say, okay, um, let's, uh, we have 10,000 scores here. All right, how many of those are greater than or equal to 750? So this creates a logical vector. We take the mean of that, and it says around 16%, okay? 16% of classrooms of 25 random students, around 16% of those will have a highest score where the highest score is 750 or higher. Um, does that kind of make sense, the process? All right, what if we wanted to do a, a classroom of 50 students rather than 25? Random sample of 50 random students. What's the probability that the highest score is going to be 750 or higher? Okay, So I do the same thing. The only thing different now is I replace my random sample. Instead of 25, I'm drawing 50 of them. All right, random sample of 50 values, same thing. And how often is the highest score greater than 750? Well, now that I've got a bigger sample, I have a higher probability that my highest score is over 750. So now that probability jumps up to around 30%, 20.2965. Okay. Again, these are all approximations. These are all estimates. Uh, and that's, um, you know, that's what all of these numeric methods try to do, is we try to estimate some kind of probability that you know, the, getting the true value would be kind of difficult to, uh, to do analytically. Um, like if I if I asked you this, if, I don't know if Professor Cristo put this on an exam, right? Would you be able to do it? Um, you might be like, oh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I actually, I don't even know how to do this uh, theoretically, right? So, so this is kind of this is kind of a tough question. But simulating the answer to get um, 
to get this, I think this, this kind of makes sense, right? We just kind of say, well, what kind of samples can we get um, under randomness? And then how often does this particular event happen? And it happens around 30% of the time. Okay, here's another question, right? So here we're gonna say a high school uh, has 200 students in its senior graduating class. And then the school administration is patting itself on the back because they say, hey, look at us. Out of our 200 students, 10 students scored 700 or higher on the SAT verbal. And they go, oh yeah, you know, that's, that's pretty good, right? We got 10 students who did this. Um, because, you know, you know, only what, two and a half percent of students would get this. So, you know, in a regular day, we would only get five and here we got 10. So it says, we're doing a great job preparing our students for college. Look at these SAT scores, right? Um, I, I, maybe this is being too cynical about school administrations here. Um, but um, the question is, does this uh, sample provide evidence that the student body is something other than a random sample drawn from the general population with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100? Or, uh, or could this happen just by kind of random sampling, right? This is kind of the question, right? Like if did uh, just by random sampling, did the school get lucky with uh, having 200 students where, you know, 10 students scored over 700. Okay, how would we answer this theoretically? Theoretically, this is a tough question to answer, I think, right? But we can simulate this. So what do we do? I'm gonna draw a sample of 200 values, normal distribution, mean 500, standard deviation 100. What is the value I wanna record, right? So I, I turn everything into SAT scores. What is the value I wanna record? Well, I'm going to sort my sample from highest to lowest, and then we're gonna take the 10th highest score, right? So I'm gonna sort them, and then I'm gonna subset, and I'm gonna grab the 10th highest score, right? And then we were gonna record that, and we're gonna say, how often is that 10th highest score 700 or higher, right? So my 10th highest, I record the 10th highest score out of you know a whole bunch of different, again, I, the idea of like two random classes of 200 students. So how often is that 10th highest score greater than or equal to 700? That happens around 3.5% of the time, okay? So maybe the school is one of the lucky 3.5%. Maybe the school, um, you know, or maybe this actually is evidence that, um, that the school is something other than a random sample where the mean is 500, okay? Um, so it says, yeah. It's not likely, you know, if, if our uh, p-values, uh, if our significance level is 5%, our p-value, empirical p-value of 3.5% is less than that, we would reject the null hypothesis and we'd say, yeah, it's unlikely for a random sample of 200 students, you know, to have 10 students over um, 700, okay? So it's reasonable to conclude that the sample of students that we're looking at is not randomly drawn from this population where the mean is 500 or standard deviation 100. Now, is that because of the school's efforts? Or is that something else, you know? Maybe uh, this this is uh, a school where, you know, I don't know, something else is going on and that's why we're getting higher higher scores, who knows, okay? But um, but this is, it, it does say that it's unlikely to happen by randomness, okay? All right, and so that's kind of how parametric bootstrap works. Let me go ahead and give you your second view quiz answer, which is the letter C, C as in cat, C as in cat. I didn't give you your first view quiz answers? Oh, man. Okay. All right. First answer was A. Okay. So first one was A, and the second one is C. Okay. All right. Thanks for keeping me on track. Okay. Now, answer number one is A. Answer number two is C. Okay. Uh, all right. So if you're, again, with parametric bootstrap, you have to make parametric assumptions about the population. You have to say the population follows this thing, and uh, and if you're comfortable with that, you know, you can simulate answers and get, uh, simulate things and get your answers. Um, you know, so like the Poisson distribution can be like, you know, how many customers show up on in a certain hour, and it's like, yeah, I don't know, whatever, right? Okay, um, non-parametric bootstrap. So actually, <laughs> When somebody talks about bootstrap, probably they're referring to non-parametric bootstrap, okay? Non-parametric bootstrap does not make any parametric assumptions on the distribution of the population. That makes sense, because it's called non-parametric bootstrap. Um, but we're still making assumptions. And what is the assumption that we're making in non-parametric bootstrap? The assumption that we're making is 
the sample I have was got uh, was obtained by random sampling and if the sample I have was obtained by random sampling it is reasonable to assume that my random sample is representative of the population okay sounds reasonable okay I have a random sample and therefore it is reasonable to assume that my random sample is representative of the population um, if you take that assumption and kind of follow it <laughs> To its conclusion, one thing that you can do is you can say, well, if my random sample is representative of the population, if I want to simulate the population, I can take my random sample, duplicate it like a million times, and that's going to be like kind of like the population. Okay? I can take my random sample, duplicate it a whole bunch of times. And then I'll have something that looks like the population. Um, I don't know if you've used Photoshop and had like this kind of this cloning tool, the rubber stamp tool or something, where you like take a patch of grass and then you like clone it everywhere, and then now you get like um, you, like you can fill in the whole field with um, the the patch of grass. I don't know if you've ever done something like that. Um, that that could work, right? If your patch of grass looks like a regular old patch of grass and you kind of copy that everywhere, you know, now you have a whole field of grass and it looks reasonable. Um, but if within your patch of grass you have some weird thing showing up, right, you got like this weird speck in there, okay, and you clone it, then that, that weird thing is going to get cloned everywhere else and, uh, and then now your entire field also looks a little bit funny. So the same kind of thing could happen here where that if your random sample has something weird, right, some unusual outlier, and you kind of say, well, I'm going to duplicate this, uh, you know, a billion times to make my population, now your population has this weird thing all over the place. Okay? So, so that's what we uh, are doing with non-parametric bootstrap. Now, um, the mathematically, you don't actually have to take your sample and duplicate it uh, a million times, okay? You can get the same idea by drawing from your sample with replacement. So if you take your sample and you uh, sample from it with replacement, that is mathematically equivalent to taking your sample and duplicating it infinitely uh, many times, okay? And so, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take our sample and sample from it with replacement and and we're going to use that to generate our sampling distributions. Does that kind of make sense for non-parametric bootstrap? Okay, uh, so just a little note here, uh, difference between all of these things. All right. So if you have data that was obtained via random sampling, you it is reasonable to do non-parametric bootstrap. Okay. If you have data that was obtained via random sampling and you're willing to make uh, distributional assumptions, you can do parametric bootstrap. Um, if you don't have random sample data, but you have um, you ran an experiment with random assignment, then you can do a randomization test, which we covered on Monday. Right? And, uh, and I wrote in both cases, but in all of these cases, we're generating a sampling distribution by simulating many instances where kind of the source of variation uh, in our statistics is is kind of this random some random process either random sampling or randomization okay uh, we're gonna look at an example from our textbook okay so this is the Ziefler I don't know uh, textbook it's 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 in the syllabus and and again uh, if you're connected to the UCLA network so either you see you know right now on on your Wi-Fi or uh, if you're at home you got to use the VPN to connect uh, you can download the textbook, okay? And uh, and this study, you know, is 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 now you know pretty old, but um, but they were looking at uh, you know some Im immigration um, values from the U.S. Census Bureau, and um, for the United States, uh, a high population of immigrants come from Latin America and and Mexico. And it says, you know, the, although the average immigrant is approximately 40 years old, large numbers of children um, uh, come and uh, enroll in U.S. schools. And then their subsequent educational achievement affects not only their own economic prospects, but also those of their families, communities, 
and the nation as, as a whole. All right, and so Stamps and Bullion uh, did this study in 2006, and they were looking at um, data from the 2000 census. Okay, so this is you know over 20 years old now, and um, and the data is recorded in this CSV file, uh, Latino Education. Okay, um, and one question that they they uh, had was, is there a link between you know where the immigrant uh, came from, okay, and their subsequent achievement? And specifically, uh, they kind of want to know, is there a difference uh, for immigrants coming from Mexico versus that of other Latin American countries? All right, so there, you know, there's some issues with this this thing. You know, they kind of just group, uh, they say Mexico versus all of the other uh, countries, which you know, there's, you know, there's a huge diversity of uh, you know between the countries, you know, between Central America and South America, and you know, within all of those countries themselves. Um, but they kind of just group all of the other Latin American countries and they separate uh, Mexico from from the others. And you know, there's, they're just kind of asking this question here. And uh, and they recorded the uh, the variables. And I tried to find more information about these variables, I, but I couldn't find it. All right, but um, it, kind of the response variable that we're looking at is this variable called uh, educational achievement. Okay, and this is some number between one and a hundred. Or 100 indicates higher levels of education achievement, and you know lower numbers uh, correspond to uh, less. But unfortunately, I don't. I have no idea like what these numbers actually, what the numbers themselves mean. So like, if somebody graduates from high school, gets a high school diploma, I don't know. Is that a 40, a 50, a 60? I don't know. Okay, if somebody graduates from uh, a four-year university with a bachelor's degree, you know, what is that number? If somebody graduates from, you know, and gets a PhD in something, what is that number? It's not described in the data, and so you just see these numbers, and they don't really have have any kind of uh, context. And so, and then you know, again, um, yeah, again, some issues with the study, but uh, but we can, uh, you know, it's from the textbook, so you can kind of read uh, the exam uh, the textbook a little in a little bit more detail, and then um, we can still do. Uh, some non-parametric bootstrap here, right? And um, the variable that, uh, the explanatory variable that we're going to use is uh, this variable uh, for did the individual come from Mexico? And the answer is either yes or no. Uh, we're going to use one for yes, zero for no here, okay? All right, and so this is kind of uh, a little bit of what the, uh, the data looks like. And again, so we're looking at this column for achievement and this column for, uh, for Mexico and um, and so again, these numbers, I don't know what 63.7 is or 63.1. These seem very strange. I don't know what, I don't know what these numbers correspond to. But, uh, but that's, uh, that's the data that we have. Okay, so um, if we uh, take this, uh, this sample of data, we have 150 values in it, okay? In our data, 116 um, people came from Mexico, uh, 34 people came from uh, other Latin American countries, and um, we can calculate the mean of these uh, 34 uh, uh, education achievement values, and the mean is 64.5, and the mean for the 116 here is 58.6, okay? And so if you take the uh, the difference between these two values, you get, you get a negative 5.9, and the question is, is this difference, is this possible from just random sampling? Or is there uh, something um, that, you know, is there evidence that, you know, there is some kind of difference between these two numbers um, that can't just be explained by randomness, right? And again, um, in, in statistics, we don't try to explain exactly what is happening. We're just saying, hey, could this be randomness or not? Okay, um, you know, as far as exploratory data analysis goes, it's often uh, helpful to draw little, uh, little plots here. So these are people coming from Mexico. These are people coming from other Latin American countries. You know, we see there's, you know, a little bit of a difference between um, the median values, the difference in the spread. Um, and this is kind of, uh, this is what we have here. Here is uh, some density plots, okay? And, uh, and the density plots, um, you know, you know, we see, okay, slightly shifted locations in the, uh, the means here. 
And it looks like, you know, we have different peaks here. I, I, again, I don't, it's hard to know exactly what these things correspond to, uh, which is unfortunate. All right. Technically, we have, our samples are big enough. We have a sample of 116 for uh, one group, a sample of 34 for another group. Technically, those are big enough usually to apply the central limit theorem. And so we could just do a classical t-test, two sample t-tests, and, um, and we would get a p-value of a, just under 5%, 0 0.04597, okay? And, um, and, uh, and so this would indicate, you know, maybe we, uh, you know, some, some evidence that um, this difference can't be explained by uh, randomness alone. But let's, let's try doing a, a non-parametric bootstrap, okay? So a non-parametric bootstrap, what we're going to do is we're going to resample our original data with replacement. The big assumption here is that our sample of 150 values is representative of the entire population, which, you know, maybe that's a little bit risky. Um, and again, sampling with replacement is equivalent to taking, making infinitely many copies of our sample and having that standard for our population. So what we want is we want to create our sampling distribution for under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, right? So we are saying, what, what is our sampling distribution if the null hypothesis were true? So the null hypothesis states that the mean education achievement level for both groups are, are equal. And if we assume that the variances are also equal, then the null hypothesis effectively says that the, the values in our, uh, in our data for both groups are coming from the same population, right? If the null hypothesis were true, all of our values are just coming from the same population. And so, um, yeah, if the null hypothesis were true, the achievement scores for um, Mexican immigrants come from the same population as the achievement scores for other Latin American immigrants, okay? The uh, parametric bootstrap, or, um, or I guess with non-parametric bootstrap, uh, we assume our sample of 150 values is representative of the entire population. We will draw two random samples coming from the same population, right? We're going to draw 116 values, which represent, um, you know, a group of the same size for uh, our immigrants that came from Mexico, 116 of them from uh, the same population as 30, the other 34. Um, what, one mistake that students do is they will resample the 116 values um, separately from the 34 values. They're going to say, okay, we're going to take the scores for uh, immigrants from Mexico, these 116 values, and they resample those. And then they say, we're going to take the 30 uh, scores for the 34 immigrants coming from other Latin American countries, and they resample those separately. Okay, That is not what we would be doing if the null hypothesis were true. If the null hypothesis were true, we can put all 150 scores together in the same population, and we are saying all of the values, you know, this sample is coming from the same population, these 34 values are coming from the same population, right? Um, and um, we're saying if, if they're coming from the same population, what kind of differences can we get? Um, and so this is, this is what it looks like, okay? So here I'm going to resample. So Latino dollar sign achieve, this is all 150 values. I'm going to sample 116 of them with replacement, okay? And here I'm sampling from the 150 values, 34 of them with replacement. This is going to be group A. This is going to be group B. We know the values in group A are a result of randomness. We know the values in group B are a result of randomness. And we say, what kind of differences, the mean of group A and the mean of group versus the mean of group B, what kind of differences can we achieve by just random sampling? And, uh, and we record all of those and we just take a look, all right? And we want to say, okay, so my observed difference was negative 5.9, and we want to know how often do I get a, a difference greater than or equal to uh, 5.9. So if I use the observed difference, which is negative 5.9, of course, 100% of my values are greater than negative. Uh, absolute value of differences will be um, greater than negative 5.9. So I have to do absolute value of differences greater than or equal to the absolute value of my observed difference, which is now going to be positive 5.9. And we get 0 0.0465. Okay, we get an estimated p-value of around 4.6%. And so it says, um, when we draw random samples where uh, the only source of variance is just kind of uh, the random sampling process, 
Can we get a difference of 5.9 from randomness alone? Yes, how often does that happen? Just a hair under 5%, okay? And so what conclusion you make would depend on your significance level. If you're using significance level 5%, you would reject it, but just barely. Um, and if you used a different significance level, like a lower one, you, you probably would not reject. This p-value that we get here aligns quite closely with the p-value from our t-test, which uh, kind of makes sense because our t we can in this situation because we have large enough samples, the t-test is probably a valid thing to apply, and so it kind of makes sense that um, when we do our study here, we get uh, you know very similar results. Okay, so that's non-parametric bootstrap. Um, we could also do a parametric bootstrap in this uh, for this study all right in parametric bootstrap we would say I'm going to assume that the population has a particular distribution so we might assume that the population comes from a normal distribution now what what would we use for the mean and standard deviation we're gonna take all 150 values we put everybody together uh, and we're gonna take uh, the mean of all 150 values. We're going to take the standard deviation of all 150 values and use that to generate my uh, for my normal distribution. So I'm going to take all 150 values, calculate the mean for M, all 150 values, calculate the standard deviation for S, and I'm going to draw 116 values from the normal distribution with some mean and standard deviation. Uh, 34 values from the normal distribution with some mean and standard deviation. We'll uh, um, take the mean of group A and the mean of group B, calculate those differences, and uh, and do this 10,000 times, and how often are those differences greater than or equal to 5.9? Again, we get 0 0.0466, okay? Um, just back here we got 0 0.0465, here we got 0 0.0466, and our t-test gave us, what, 0 0.0459. So, so all within very close <laughs> values of each other, okay? So again, we're getting something just uh, a shade under 5%, which indicates, yeah, you know what, the, the data that, we're have, that we have, you know, these differences perhaps uh, is not a result of just randomness alone, perhaps something else is going on, and, and that would require, you know, further study uh, to kind of figure out, um, you know, what is that, what, what is causing the difference, but but it might be, you know, or it could be randomness, right? Uh, could happen with a probability of around, you know, 4.5%. All right, let me go ahead and give you your last view quiz answer. Last view quiz answer today is the letter E. E as an elephant. E as an elephant. And, um, and we'll go ahead and wrap that up here. And um, have a great rest of your day, and we will see you on Friday.